If you're watching this video, I think it's safe to assume that you've heard of Pokemon Run and Bun. An incredibly hard ROM hack of Pokemon Emerald made by Amazing Nuzlocke or Dexa, Pokemon Run and Bun adds every Pokemon and mechanics up to Generation 8, completely reworks every single boss fight, switches up the order of a few gym leaders, and even adds some insane permanent field effects for a few late game areas. At the time of me writing the script, only three people have gone to confirmed victory over this game playing with hardcore Nuzlocke rules. And as soon as I got MGBA to work, I set out to beat this game. However, I didn't want to play with hardcore Nuzlocke rules for the simple reason that my motivation for playing this game was to see everything it had to offer. I didn't want to be stuck in the early game forever, especially since I had literally no experience playing ROM hacks before picking up this game. With that said, I still wanted a challenge, so I decided to play with the following self-imposed rules. I can only catch one Pokemon on every route, and I can only progress past a fight once I beat it deathless. Since set mode is forced in this game and the bag is inaccessible during trainer battles, these rules effectively make it a deathlock with save states. I was going to make it through the entire game without losing a single Pokemon. And spoiler alert, I had the time of my life. This is the story of how I beat Pokemon Run and Bun Deathless. Chapter 1 Wow, I'm bad at this. After getting settled in, I'm given the choice between the Sinnoh starters and choose Piplup for the phenomenal typing and the easiest rival fights. I name him E123. By the way, I'm naming every Pokemon I get during this run after a YouTuber who'd recognize me. After saving Professor Birch and getting some supplies, including a toggleable repellent and an endless candy key item that will allow me to level my entire team to the level cap of each stretch of the game without any grinding, I head off to expand my team. I catch Armo Gaming the Surskit in Little Root Town, Revolution the Galarian Zigzagoon in Route 101, Eclipse the Gossip Flare on 103, BTD6 Index the Natu on 102, and in Old Ale Town, I catch my boy, my dog, my homie, Ryan Mahalik. After knocking out some trainers, including the metronome spammer who didn't pull anything funny, I pick up Toy Time King the Yanma on 104, who proceeds to absolutely demolish the first boss fight of the run, the Petalburg Woods Team Aqua Grunt. The Grunt's Carvana, Krogunk, and Execute couldn't handle Yanma with an assist from Growlithe. With the first boss fight complete, the built-in level cap is increased from 12 to 17, and the game forces me to Dufer Town. Once I get to Dufer Town, I catch Ray Misty of the Makuhita and the Grass Patches, followed by Two Prude the Choodle and Akira the Horsey in the surrounding routes. As for my granite cave encounter, something insane happens. I've been resetting for the encounters I wanted, but I somehow managed to grab an impish 28 defense IV fan pee without any resets that evolved into Battle Armor Dawn fan. Uh, welcome to the team, Katsune Niku. <laughs> After sweeping bug time with Growlithe, catching Prisma Ace the Tertuga on 109 and Lombre 914 the Quillfish in Slateport City, both of which will help greatly with the upcoming Brawly fight, I challenge the game's second boss fight, the back-to-back -back fight against Team Aqua Grunts in the Slateport Museum. I make it through the first grunt without much issue, but as the second fight begins, I realize that I don't really have the best answer for Marini or Frillish. My out was to mud slap the Marini down with Tortuga, then hope my 5 HP Natu is able to win the 1v1. Thankfully, BTD6 Index clutches up, but that brings in Frillish. I switch to Gossipler, thinking she'll be able to outlast the Frillish, but Water Pulse confuses on the switch in, making me dead to Hex. Because of this, I need to hard switch into Choodle, and hope Frillish doesn't find high enough rolls with Hex and Shockwave, and that I get lucky enough with Bite. Luckily, I'm able to find high enough rolls with Bite and get the 2 at KO, though if either Bite had crit or flinched, I'd have won anyway. Last is Whirlipede, who gets easily beaten by my family. With the Museum Grunts defeated, the level cap is raised to 21, and I can challenge Brawly, who's the first gym leader in this game. Before heading back to Duford, I crush Camper Gabby, catch Let's React the Marine, and pick up the first of 14 rare candies. These are fittingly rare items that allow a Pokemon to be brought over the built-in level cap. I immediately use my rare candy to evolve Surskit into Masquerain, who proceeds to almost solo sweep Brawly's gym trainers, and is selected as my lead for Brawly himself. Brawly has a terrifying team of six for the first gym leader to have with Combuskin, him on top, and Scraggy being the biggest threats. That's not even mentioning the fact that he leads with the Legendary, which all gym leaders have at least one of in this game. 
Brawly's lead legendary Cub Fu is dispatched easily by my Masquerade, bringing in Combuskin. This chicken has the potential to run over any team without good enough bulk, but I luckily have arguably the best chicken answer at this point of the game. Solid Rock Tortuga. Prisma switches in on Incinerate and two shots with Aqua Jet, easily shrugging off a double kick. Him on top is brought in next, and my only play is to pivot this down. By switching between Masquerade on Mach Punch and Makuhita on Rock Slide, I can lower him on top's attack while stacking Fake Out Chip on it. After enough drops, I bring in Fampy to get the remaining chip needed with Bulldoze. Masquerade switches in safely on Mach Punch and kills with Gust into Quick Attack, while not being in danger of Rock Slide crit since him on top will always Mach Punch if it sees that I have any healing rolls on it. With him on top down, Brawly sends out his ace, Scraggy. I switch to Quillfish on Rock 2, chunk Scraggy's health with Revenge, and finish Scraggy off with Masquerade, bringing in the dreaded Retaliate Eject Button Low Honey. I immediately quick attack to send Low Honey out, meaning I only have to deal with one booster Retaliate. Poliwhirl gets beaten by my newly evolved Flaffy, and after the booster Retaliate gets easily tanked by Tortuga, Low Punny gets killed by Quillfish, granting me the first gym badge. Making my way to Rustboro City, I pick up Scoocha, the Poison Heal Shroomish, in Petalburg Woods. I can't actually use Poison Heal for gym battles, since leaders and gym trainers heal the party before you battle them, but Poison Heal is still an amazing ability I'll be using to great effect, and Breloom's ability to resist Edgequake is invaluable. I also catch Isimo the Togedemaru in Rustboro City, foregoing the opportunity to get Aerodactyl early for a Pokémon whose insane typing, ability, and move pool allows me to basically skip the rest of the early game. <laughs> Wait, that wasn't even intentional. Roxanne has a pretty diverse team. Despite her being a Rock-type specialist, she, along with almost every other gym leader, will have at least one Pokémon that matches her theme without matching her type. In Roxanne's case, she starts with Lee Bishop that I can safely answer with Breloom. That unexpectedly brings out her Ace Lunatone early, but I'm glad to get Roxanne's scariest Pokémon out of the way now. Lunatone sees a kill with Icy Wind, so I go to Thick Fat Hariyamba, who doesn't take much damage at all from a 20 base power stored power and should be able to kill with a boosted payback. Except I didn't know that the damage calculator shows boosted payback's damage if you're slower, and Lunatone lives activating its weakness policy. Fortunately, Isibo comes in clutch by tanking the plus two 100 base power stored power without any issues and killing with Metal Claw. Next comes a freaking Zydog, which I answer with by far the best Zygarde counter in the entire game, the previously mentioned Battle Armor Donovan, who tanks anything Zygarde can throw at her and two shots with Ice Shard. Aurorus is up next, and I pivot Hariyama into Breloom into Togedemaru to kill with a quad effective Metal Claw after Iron Barb's chip. Lastly, my newly evolved Eldegoss is able to solo Roxanne's Karakost on Soul Rock, giving me the second gym badge. Time to head to Mawville. Chapter 2. I don't think I should have won that. The path between Rustboro and Mawville is filled with a lot of tough trainers, in particular, the double battle built around Lightning Rod, which I'd be by taking the Emolga out turn 1. However, right after that is Shell, well known for having the potential to end anyone's run with bad enough RNG. I have good enough answers to four of her Pokémon, but two of them are especially scary. After beating Shell's Lapras with Hariyama and Rhydon with Breloom, thankfully avoiding Stealth Rocks being set up, Shell sends out Togekiss. Ampharos chunks his health, but I end up having to risk my Togedemaru to a 1 in 4 Mystical Fire chance. Luckily, I come in on Air Cutter and the fight is back on track. At least until Shell sends out Skillbro next. My designated answer to this is Niku, but she comes in on Whirlpool, and the win is not guaranteed. It's close, but Niku is able to beat the Skillbro. Delcat is hardwalled by my Dreadnought, and Vespaquin can't touch Isimo, and I make it to Watson. Watson has a team that looks difficult to plan for. Between Rotom, Lantern, and Electros, he's got a lot of bulk to work with, not even mentioning the more obvious threats. However, this might just be my favorite gym leader to plan in the entire game. In preparation for Watson, I pick up JT Pilfered the Chinchu and Zonos the Sandile in the areas surrounding Mawville, evolve Zonos into Crocodile using my second rare candy, and head into the battle. Watson leads with a sturdy Custap Berry Explosion Magnezone. Isimo breaks Sturdy with Fake Out, then switches to Crocodile in the near guaranteed discharge. Magnezone falls, and Watson goes to a Zara Aura. Yeah, a Zara Aura in the third gym. 
I take a page out of Pokemon Challenge's book and triple pivot the Zero Aura using Crocodile, Togedemaru, and Masquerain to stack up Iron Barbs and Fake Out Chip on the Mythical, leading to Togedemaru killing it. Lantern is handled by Eldegoss and Hariyama, and the Rotom fan is beaten by Hariyama and my own Lantern, both holding Rossberries to stave off a boost attacks. For Electros, I pivot like 20 times to stack Intimidate Drops and heal up my Volt Absorb Lantern so we can knock it out. Last is the first Mega of the run, Mega Ampharos. Thankfully, by pivoting through Togedemaru, I can get Crocodile in safely and Discharge, and two-shot with Stomping Tantrum while avoiding Dragon Breath Paralysis with a Held Cherry Bear. Watson down, but something much scarier is on the horizon. Cycling Road Rival. This is commonly known as the hardest fight of Run and Bun's early game, no matter what starter you picked. Since I picked Piplup, I got the easiest one, but May's Sceptile team is still full of big threats in Psychic Terrain, with Kingdra being the scariest. Here. We. Go. May leads Ndidi, and I lead Eclipse, who spams Synthesis until she's hit with Expanding Force. This lowers Ndidi's speed thanks to Eldegoss' Cotton Down ability, and with Eclipse at full health, she's still only base Expanding Force. I switch into Shane, now an Obstagoon, who with the speed drop can outspeed and kill Ndidi with Brick Break and a Night Slash, taking the lead down without any screens on the field. Sceptile is sent out, and I'm forced to let Eclipse take a Leaf Storm to burn the Gecko's White Herb and let Togedemaru switch on an Acrobatics to 1v1 the Sceptile. Halucha is sent in, and I pivot Quillfish into Ampharos, who's somehow able to beat the Halucha without taking a hit. Next up is Kingdra, who I ask Eclipse to deal with, which was a mistake. Kingdra sets his attack up to monstrous levels of Dragon Dance, and while Cotton Down keeps his speed in check, Eclipse is in massive danger. My win condition is to hit two Sings on the Lumberry Kingdra, switch to Ampharos, and pray for no two-turn sleep. And that's exactly what happens. Quillfish beats the Grand Bull, and Protect Caracosta beats a Solar Beam Power of Houndoom, and I make it past Cycling Road Rival. I honestly don't think I should've. And to think this was the easiest Cycling Road Rival. On the way back to Petalburg City in Norman, I faced several tough double battles that required a ton of planning including a fight against a Tailwind team requiring a precise 9-turn pivot sequence, and a team built around Sleep Moves and Unearth, where I went in with Discharge Lantern and Discharge Ampharos, and somehow won. I make it back to Petalburg City and make my way through the gym. I choose the most common path, fighting the Machamp Trainer, whose Machamp I have a solid answer for in person Barry Zatu. The other two trainers weren't as tough, and I get to challenge Norman. Norman is the hardest single battle gym leader in the game. His team is designed to pounce on any weakened opponent's box and end their run. However, even with the box I have, there's still one Pokemon that's going to give me a lot of trouble. Nothing to do but walk in and start the fight. Norman leads with a Porygon 2, who I beat with my Haryama. This baits an Azumarill, who I can counter with Quillfish. Quillfish's Poison Jab is easily a 2-hit KO on this Azumarill. Oh, we're a 1-hit KO! Next up is by far Norman's scariest Pokemon from my box, Diggersby. My out here is to Intimidate Pivot the Bunny down, then two-shot with Skull from Masquerade while hoping I don't die to two foul plays. Luckily, I survive, and Norman sends in his Meloetta! Luckily, by pivoting through Eldegoss and Quillfish, I'm able to bring in Nico on a Zen Headbutt, charm her down without risking critical hits thanks to Battle Armor, and kill with high horsepower. The Skill Link King's Rock Chinchino is beaten with one of the most fun strategies I've ever come up with. I pivot through Quillfish to bring in Eldegoss, who thanks to Cotton Down, is able to lower Chinchino's speed to minus 5, allowing Hariyama to outspeed and kill the Chinchino with Brick Break. Last is Mega Pidgeot, who my Empoleon is able to 1v1. Norman has been defeated, and I'm officially out of Pokemon Run and Bun's early game. Now, some of you might be wondering why I just skipped the entire Flannery split. I didn't. She's next. Chapter 3. I hate double battle gym leaders. <laughs> Next on my agenda is defeating the Winstraits, who instead of guarding the Macho Brace, now guard the Go Goggles. I defeat the first three Winstraits without much issue, but Vicky leads with a Mega Metachamp, who I answer by intimidating it down, then defeating it and the Crocodile in the back with Niku. With the Winstraits defeated, I can make my way to Fall Armor. I don't think there's any split that showcases how difficult every random trainer's team is than the trek between Mauville and Fall Armor. There are multiple Sandvale Bright Powder Pokémon, some of them with Focus Punch or even Substitute, and a team with U-Turn Scizor into Arena Trap Dug Trio. And that's just the first leg. Despite what I'm faced with, I managed to get to Fall Arbor Town, where I'm faced with a newly added fight against Winstraight Veto. 
The MVP for this fight is a Pokémon I haven't shown off until now, Hamilton the Hisuian Arcanine. Hamilton's ability to counter both the lead Alakazam and the Crobat allows me to spare two team slots to deal with Vito's terrifying Mega Aggron, which I handle with Masquerade and Kingdra. Vito's Crawdont, Swellow, and Breloom are easily dealt with, and I can move on to Mount Chimney and Maxi. Unfortunately, I didn't fight the two trainers right before Fall Arbor as a double battle, meaning I don't have the Shed Shell for the fight against Maxi. This is a problem, since Maxi has a Wob effect. I need to know Run and Bun Switch AI perfectly, so the Pokémon that baits in Wobbuffet can also beat it. Luckily, I see a way through. Miku invalidates the lead Crustle thanks to Rapid Spin, baiting in the Zarude. Yes, the Zarude. Masquerade takes down the Zarude after dodging a crit, baiting in Aerodactyl. I pivot between Togemaru and Eldegoss to beat the Aerodactyl, baiting in the Kaomu. I answer the Kaomu with my Yen Mega, who just barely outspeeds it. Mega Camerupt is baited in. Luckily, Quillfish is able to beat both Camerupt and the incoming Wobbuffet thanks to his access to Toxic and the Wobbuffet's lack of access to Safeguard. Seriously, Dexa, why didn't you give any of them Safeguard? Now for Flannery. Hamilton shows his stuff by carrying me through Flannery's gym trainers, but he isn't coming to Flannery herself since he's just not fast enough. Instead, I catch two new Pokémon and add them to the team. In the Jagged Pass, I catch Benstein 999 the plus speed nature Garchomp, who I'm forced to use both the rare candy on and give up one of my heart scales to max out Benstein's speed IV just so I can outspeed Flannery's most problematic team member. Flannery is the first double battle gym leader, the first gym leader with Pokemon whose levels are higher than the level cap, and easily the hardest gym leader so far. Beyond her Sun Team, with some absolutely terrifying threats, including a Mega Charizard Y, a Talonflame with Gen 6 Scale Wings, and Entei, the fact that it's a double battle is really bad news for me, because I am really, really bad at planning double battles. That bodes well for the Elite Four. Fortunately, the Charizard and Talonflame are answered by my boy, my dog, my homie, Mahalik Plays, the Dusk Lichen Rock I catch on Mount Chimney. I also hatch a Trico in Lava Ridge Town that I named Saiyan Scholar, who might be important later. Mahalik Plays is able to immediately one-shot the Charizard with Accelerock, as Isimo, who is my other lead and my best pivot, just fakes out Zelazzle. Entei is sent in, and I can't control what it goes for, so I spiky shield Isimo and switch to Benstein. Entei sees a fast kill on both targets, so it's a true 50-50. I prefer Solar Beam in the Lycan Rock slot, though, and that's what I get. From there, I switch to Caracosta on the double fire move, and dig the Entei, just barely outspeeding it thanks to my rare candy and hard scale. If the Entei was level 57, I wouldn't have needed the rare candy, but because it's over the level cap, I needed to use it. I then switch back to Isimo on the guaranteed Sludge Bomb and Solar Beam. I spiky shield again and kill both targets with Earthquake from Benstein. The reason why I wanted Entei to Solar Beam my Garchomp was because I wanted him at low enough health to bait Incineroar instead of Marowak. If Entei had attacked Togedomaru on the second turn instead of Lycanroc, I'd have wasted a turn Iron Heading Salazzle and protected with Karakasa turn 4 so Garchomp could take a third heat wave. Baiting Incineroar is that important. But instead of that, everything goes according to plan and Talonflame and Incineroar are baited in. I double switch out to Hariyama and Lycanroc, who easily shrug off the moves sent their way. From there, it's game over. I switch Hariyama out for Dreadnought and Accelerock the Talonflame as Incineroar fails to do anything. Alolan Marowak is sent out, but both Marowak and Incineroar are promptly knocked out by double Rock Slide from Lycanroc and Dreadnought. And with that, the hardest gym leader so far is down. After some easy fights on the Slateport Beach, I get access to both the Surf HM and Mega Evolution. On to Four Tree City and Winona. Chapter 4. Man, am I glad I picked Piplup. With access to Surf, I can get a ton of encounters I wasn't certain of before, as well as some areas I've delayed. I catch Kletch the Bee Drill on Route 118 and immediately pick up her Mega Stone, the Lockyer Boys, the Poplio in Petalburg City, a location I delayed until I got Surf, DRXX the Excadrill in 111, Bumbo Bob the Fungus in Verdanturf Town, DJ Tile Turnip the Scyther in Fall Upper Town, Sam Animations the Basculin in the Abandoned Ship, who I delay my evolution for so I can get both Head Smash and Poltergeist, KR the Bear Skewda in 134, Smell Had the Jutini on 108, T the Zoroark in Mirage Tower, Flambe 13 the Camera Up in Fiery Path, E the Houndoom on 112, and Brickbrock 24 the Gumi in 119. 
Y Evolve into Isui and Gudra. From there, it's boss rush time, starting with Aqua Admin Shelly coming at me with a terrifying team. I beat the lead Mian Shao with Isimo and Masquerain, Nihiligo gets walled by DRXX as it thankfully doesn't set up rocks, Choice Band Dragonite's Aqua Tail gets quad resisted by Kingdra, and Tornadus comes in. After chipping in with Isimo, I switch to Bear Skewed on a Heat Wave and get burned. This is bad as I can't kill the Tornadus with Bear Skewed now. I'm luckily able to stall it out with Togedemaru, but the Lantern is now using a random move. Kingdra doesn't die to anything, so I switch it in, but the Lantern went for the worst case scenario. Volt Switch. Mega Blastoise is switched in, and I'm forced to pivot through Excadrill into 50-50 between Dragon Pulse and Dark Pulse, then go to Sceptile, and hope Blastoise clicks Surf instead of Dark Pulse. I win the freaking 1 in 4, and kill the Blastoise, and pivot through Kingdra to get Excadrill in safely against Lantern and kill with Earthquake. Shelly down, but the literal next fight is another boss fight. Route 119, Rival. This was, by far, my favorite fight in the entire game. I'm so proud of the plan I came up with, so enjoy. I lead with Isimo and Life Orb Basket Legion against Mace, Sceptile, and Mantine. Isimo fakes out the Mantine while Basket Legion one-shots the Mega Sceptile with Ice Fang before it can do anything. Since I have Isimo in slot 1, this baits out Lucario, seeing the fast kill with close combat. I spike his shield on the guaranteed double target into the Togedemaru slot, and kill the Lucario with Liquidation, bringing in Gastron, who sees the kill with Earth Power. Mantine can still only attack Isimo, so I switch him out for Dragonite on the guaranteed Hydro Pump and Earth Power, as Basket Legion is untouched and can chunk Gastron's health with Poltergeist. From there, I can't control what Mantine goes for, so I switch back into Isimo as Basket Legion kills Gastron. I get the best case scenario with Helping Hand, but Mantine couldn't kill anything without a Hurricane Crit on Basket Legion specifically, which Mantine wasn't even that likely to target. Raichu is sent out and is guaranteed to thunder the Basket Legion. I fake out Mantine and switch to Garchomp. From there, both sides attack Isimo as I switch him out again. This time for Brick Brock the Hisui and Gudra in his debut battle whose massive special defense and shell armor ability allows him to easily take the FOUR attacks sent at him over the next two turns, as he and Benstein take out the Raichu with Dig and Flash Cannon. Last up is May's own Gudra, and I switch out Brick Brock for Lantern as Benstein kills the Gudra with Dragon Fang Dragon Claw, as Lantern shrugs off a hurricane while holding up Personberry for a potential confusion. Finally, I switch out Benstein for Dragonite to save him from a potential Hydro Pump critical hit, which actually happens, as Lantern takes out Mantine, ending my favorite fight of the run. I have a video on Winona already, so check it out if you haven't already. But briefly, Basket Legion got crucial damage on two problematic Pokemon after he forced the Choice Scarf Staraptor to switch, Hamilton got two kills, and Mega Altaria lost to Primarina. Easiest gym leader, I think. With the Fly HM, even more tedium is gone and I can make my way to Lily Cove City. However, Run and Bun is about to show its true strength. It's time to take down the evil team leaders, and it's time for the permanent field effects. Chapter 5. Hey Dexa, tone it down a bit. It's time for another encounter spree before I challenge Mei for the last time. I catch Say Goodbye the Kecleon in Fortree City, who I tried to bring to Sunfights but never found a use for, Unique Potatoes the Drapion in the Desert Underpass, Smart Persan the Weezing in Route 113, who I immediately trade for Lizzie, Chalkbox the Alolan Sandslash in Altering Cave, Randy the Corviknight in 114, Super Saiyan Rainbow the Halucha in 105, and Rig the Gyarados in 120. From there, my final fight with Mei was by far the easiest, despite her bringing a Melmetal and a Galarian Moltres. Lizzie walled the lead Garchomp, though he did set up rocks. Those rocks were immediately blown away by my Empoleon, who walled the incoming Alakazam. The Machamp was chunked by Lizzie and killed by Halucha, leaving Lizzie at 45 health. Luckily, she could still pivot into body press from Melmetal no problem, as Isimo whittled away its health with Iron Barbs and Spiky Shield, before finally killing with Zing Zap. The Mega Sceptile was countered by Randy, and the Galarian Moltres was beaten by my Primarina, killing with Hydro Pump into Moonblast to play around Berserk. May down. Before heading to Map Pyre, I catch Crab Bar the Metacham in 121, Furt's the Blastoise in the Safari Zone, Barbitos the Beldum in the Lake of City, and the most important encounter of the run, TS Guy the Dreepy on Route 122. Fly high, Leo. On to Map Pyre, and on to the start of Run and Bun's permanent field effects. 
Dragapult is able to tear through most of the trainers in Mount Pyre, but he's useless for the final few, because the top of Mount Pyre has permanent Tailwind running against my party, doubling the speed of the opposing team. That's hard enough to deal with on its own, but the fight against Archie on the top of the mountain has me team up with Shell. However, Shell might actually save me here, since her Rhyperior one-shots half of Archie's team. I'm only allowed to bring three Pokémon, so I select Primarina, Crocodile, and Excadrill. Shell leads with Delcaddy, and Archie leads with Hydreigon and Rapid Strike Urshifu. Primarina immediately kills the Urshifu as Shell's Delcaddy dies. As Rotom Frost and Rhyperior are sent in, my plan for this fight gets put into practice. Leave the Hydrogen up and pivot for my goddamn life as Shell's Rhyperior kills Rotom and Dragargle. Sharpedo gets sent in before he's supposed to, but Rhyperior is able to take him out with two high horsepowers as I keep pivoting between Primarina and Crocodile. As Stack Attack comes out, I'm forced to switch to Excadrill and hope Stack Attack and High Dragon don't click a move that kills him. Luckily, I come in on resisted hits and Rhyperior makes us a 2v1. Primarina resists everything that Hydreigon has, but a Stone Edge miss into a Dark Pulse flinch makes me have to risk Excadrill to a crit. DRXX comes in... and holds. Shell's Rhyperior hits the most important Stone Edge of the fight to get his fifth kill, Archie is defeated, and I've made it past Run and Bun's first permanent field effect. But that was absolutely nothing compared to what's coming up next. Magma Hideout, for the most part, isn't that bad. Garchomp helps out a lot, whether Mega or not, and in fact solo sweeps his one Grunt's entire team. However, he's once again useless for the final room, which has permanent Magma Storm. Dexa? I think that's a bit too much. I had to make perfect use of my Shed Shells, Ghost Types, and Pivot moves in order to get through these five fights deathless. The first three Grunts are tough but doable, Tabitha was actually the hardest single battle of the run, though I didn't record the footage. And Maxi... I catch Hobby face the Litwick and Mount Pyre, as I see no other way to get through the fight. Maxi leads with a Groudon to set up permanent sun, and I lead with my Sceptile, pre-damage to activate his overgrow ability and one-shot with Solar Beam. Life Orb Tangrowth is sent out, and thanks to Sceptile's Shed Shell, I can safely switch out for my counter, Hobby face the Chandelure. Hobbyface shrugs off Sleep Powder by the Chesto Berry and kills the Tangra. Since ghost types can't be trapped, Hobbyface switches up for Lizzie to answer the incoming Garchomp. As it turns out, this was a bad idea, but Garchomp misses a Stone Edge, which probably saved Lizzie. Choice Scarf Naganadel is put in position to destroy Lizzie, but another Shed Shell lets Dragapult come in on a resisted Sludge Wave, tank another, and kill with Dragon Darts. Dragon Dance Mew is sent out, and it go to Basque Legion on the Psychic Fangs. Basque Legion gets an incredibly clutch critical hit poltergeist, without which I probably wouldn't have been able to deal with the mute. And last up is Maxi's ace, Destiny Bond, Mega Houndoom. Houndoom on Basque Legion, sees a kill with Dark Pulse or Solar Beam, we'll always go for it because it has speeds. Both of these should proc Halucha's Citrus Berry. And now, with Unburden activated, I only have one thing left to click. Aqua Hideout is a lot easier than Magma Hideout, and I catch the driving school.ca, the static, static, Hisui, and Electro there. Math is a lot easier than the past two boss fights. Barbitos the Metagross is able to beat the lead Mamoswine, though rocks are set up. Matt's Dragapult is beaten by Primarina, and for Dracovish, I ask my own Dragapult to take exactly one Ficious Rend, outspeed the Choice Scarf Dracovish, and kill with Dragon Darts. 
Cartana sent in, so I pimped through Isimo on random move to bait Sacred Sword back to Dragapult, who kills with Shadow Ball after the chip. Even with the literal worst RNG possible, Raikou loses to Ben Stein, and Mega Gyarados is invalidated by Brigaloo. On to Moss Deep City and the 7th Gym. After some tricky double battles in Moss Deep Gym, including one where I out Trick Room to Trick Room team using my Mega Camerupt, I'm faced with a unique threat in Tate and Liza. The twins have been changed from a double battle to a back-to-back -back fight against both their teams of four for a total of eight Pokémon. Looks horrifying at first glance, especially considering the team has four legendaries and two mythicals. However, looking at my box, I realize something. This team is incredibly weak to Dragapult. After Dragapult literally solo sweeps Tate's Azelf, Megalodios, Zoroark, and Hoopa without taking a hit, it's on to Liza. Assault Vast Tapu Lele gets one shot by Phantom Force, bringing in Mega Metagross. For this monster, I bring the same pivot trio I used for Zeraora, Isimo, Masquerade, and Crocodile. By baiting immunities into the latter two and Meteor Mashes into Isimo, I can stack Iron Barb's chip on the Mega before bringing Dragapult back in on Earthquake and getting TS Guy's sixth kill of the fight with Phantom Force. Hoopa Unbound is put in position to destroy Dragapult with Hyperspace Fury, and I switch to Crocodile on Expanding Force. I then realize I wasn't calculating Hoopa's damage in Psychic Terrain, which is pretty bad. My plan was to bait Hyperspace Fury to lower Hoopa's defense, allowing Dragon Darts to get the guarantee KO. However, since it's Expanding Force, that won't work. I switch back to Dragapult on Guaranteed Aura Sphere and give Hoopa one more chance to go for Hyperspace Fury, but it once again goes for Expanding Force. Hoopa is now at minus two attack, meaning it can't see a kill with Hyperspace Fury on Dragapult anymore. Because of this, there's no way around what I have to do next. I need to risk a critical hit or sphere on Crocodile. I dodge the crit, chip to Hoopa, and switch Dragapult back in on Aura Sphere, who proceeds to kill both Hoopa and the Soul Dew Latios, ending with eight out of eight kills. I've got one gym to go, but I've got to stop climate change before I can challenge one. Be right back. Chapter 6. Who here remembers the land before time? With the 7th gym badge obtained, I now have access to the unquestionably best Pokémon in the entire game. I pick up Moss Deep City's Gift Cubfu, who I named Chom Chom, and who ends up evolving into Rapid Strike Urshifu. We're online. After dodging a high roll critical hit Ice Punch against Courtney's Buzzwool, I make my way to the second and last tag battle of the run, Maxi and Tabitha, in the Space Center. While I could rely on Shell to get stuff done against Archie, Steven literally can't do anything besides die. Because of this, I need to use the turns he's on the field to do as much damage as possible and hopefully make this a 1v1, which isn't even guaranteed to work out since I can only bring three Pokémon. My lead for this fight is Ferd's the Mega Blastoise, with Hamilton and Breloom in the back. Ferd starts by clicking Water Spout to kill the lead Landorus, as Steven's Dialga falls and Mega Tyranitar's Taunt gets redirected. I chip Heatran as Steven's Metagross dies and another Taunt goes wide. On the third turn, and Steven's last, I take out the Tyranitar and miss a range on the Heatran, but Heatran surprisingly misses Magma Storm and dies to Mega Steelix. Unfortunately, Steelix can't do anything else, as it always dies to Moltres' Burnout. To make matters worse, Mega Garchomp targets my Blastoise, and I miss another range with Ice Beam, leaving me with a Blastoise on the edge of death in front of a Moltres and a Mega Garchomp. At this point, my literal only play is to hard switch to Hamilton in front of a Garchomp with Stone Edge and high horsepower, and hope the Garchomp uses Scale Shot. Unfortunately, the Garchomp clicks Stone Edge. ANOTHER STONE MISS TO RUIN MAXI'S CAREER! Hamilton's able to sweep the remainder of the fight, and the path to Seafloor Cavern is open. I catch TSP the Aerodactyl on Route 126, get his Mega Stone, and proceed to go absolutely ham with Mega Aerodactyl for the rest of the run. Although I don't have much footage of it, the absolute destruction TSP was able to rain down on late-game trainers made him by far the best Mega Evolution I ever picked up. Well, besides Beezus. Seafloor Cavern's permanent Aurora Veil is annoying but not impossible to deal with since I have two excellent defoggers and a Brick Break move tutor. However, for my last encounter with Shelly, I had to bite the bullet and use a hard scale to teach Steel Aurora to Isimo. 
The fight wasn't easy even with Misty terrain removed, but I was able to get through it with some good plays, including Sceptile getting back-to-back -back kills on Mega Slowbro and Darm G. And now, for Archie. The final evil team fight of the game, and easily one of the hardest. This time, there's no permanent field effect, save for permanent rain. It's a no-hold-barred single battle against perhaps the scariest rain team of the run, featuring Life Orb Overquill, Zapdos, and anchored by Mega Swampert. And all of that isn't even mentioning Archie's lead, Kyogre. As Archie sends out the god of the ocean, I send out the only answer I have. Alright Archie, you got Kyogre, but I got the God Slayer! Saiyan Scholar has already killed Groudon, and you're next. Overquill is sent in and is going for random move, so I bring out E123 the Empoleon for what turned out to be the last boss fight I ever brought my starter to. I switch in, dodge a high roll throat drop on the next turn, and kill with Hydro Pump. Great job, E123. I'll see you on the other side. Superior is sent in, and I make a snap decision and go hard Aerodactyl on Leaf Storm. Dual Wing Beat kills Superior, and Aegislash is sent in. Chomp Chomp takes the incoming Flash Cannon, and even if Aegislash went for King's Shield, he'd be two shot by Liquidation due to Unseen Fist. Zapdos is sent out, and I realize I have to risk a 50 50. Luckily, Aerodactyl comes in on Hurricane, dodges crit and confusion, and lands a Stone Edge for the Oka. Last is Mega Swampert, and the responsibility for taking this monster down falls on the entire team. Masquerade to switch on an Earthquake, intimidate the Swampert down, and bait Liquidation. Eldegoss to switch in on Liquidation, slow the Swampert down with Cotton Down, and bait Ice Punch. Urshifu to switch on an Ice Punch and bait Earthquake. And finally, as I switch Urshifu out again, I ask one more team member to do what he has to do. This is now at minus two attack. And guaranteed to liquidation. There's really nothing I can do about this. At the end of the day, no matter what this pivot is, it's gonna all boil down to the same thing. No matter how much intimidate pivoting I do, no matter if I bring this in an earthquake or liquidation, it's always gonna come down to this. Sceptile has to dodge this crit. Yes! Archie down! With Archie down, I make my way to Sky Pillar and watch the most iconic scene in Pokemon history. This was the first time it's ever played as a result of my actions, and it felt pretty good, not gonna lie. After making my way through the excellently redesigned Sutopolis Gym, I challenged the last gym leader. Juan brandishes a diverse double battle team, featuring Keldeo, Salamence, Glastrier, and Mega Glalie, making him maybe the hardest gym leader in the game. And... Uh, I just realized I forgot to record the footage for the Juan battle. So basically what happened is Metagross got three kills, I killed Glalie and Salamence at the same time, then double switched and took care of Vasco Legion and Glass Rear. But that doesn't matter, cuz. One down! Chapter 7. Sorry, Lawrence. We've reached the point where most trainers I'm facing are pulling out Omega. As I make my way through Victory Road, I face. <gasps> Mega Gardevoir, Mega Aerodactyl, Mega Venusaur, Mega Pinsir, Mega Beetroll, Mega Ampharos, Mega Sceptile, Mega Kangaskhan, Mega Blaziken, Mega Swampert, Mega Galley, Mega Heracross, Mega Sableye, Mega Charizard Y, Mega Charizard X, and Mega Mawile. <sighs> I reach the end of Victory Road, leaving only one fight between me and the Pokemon League. A rematch against Win Straight Vito. As Vito brings out his Ndidi, I lead with a Pokemon that I can pretty safely say has been the MVP of the run. Isimo, the Togedemaru. Despite his merely serviceable stats, Isimo has been doing his job throughout this playthrough, being a reliable source of chip damage between Iron Barbs, Fake Out, and Spiky Shield, and even neutralizing some terrain teams thanks to his new access to Steel Rolling. Thanks for being the best pivot I could have asked for. 
if only the real Isimo was that reliable. After Isimo removes Vito's psychic terrain with Steel Roller, Hamilton kills the lead in DD, baiting in Feramosa. I switch Dragapult in safely on guaranteed close combat, and Choice Garf Dragapult gets his first kill of the battle with Draco Meteor. Mega Garchomp beats the Aggron with Iron Head into Earthquake to play around Sturdy Metal Burst, even getting the flinch. On Cloister, I pivot Isimo, on Freeze Dry, wait, that's Shell Smash. With Cloister at plus two, I have exactly one option, and I immediately see it. I break Cloister's Focus Sash with Fake Out, switch Dragapult into a plus two Hydro Pump, and dodge Crit. Thanks to Dragapult's Choice Scarf, he outspeeds the plus two Cloister and gets his second kill. Halucha is next, and I realize I need to be positioned well when this dies. The upcoming Mega Alakazam outspeeds most of my team, and although I brought Say Goodbye the Proteon Kecleon with a plan to sucker punch the Alakazam twice, I can't let Alakazam trace Proteon, otherwise I have to risk a 50-50 the next turn. Instead, I pivot to Garchomp on Halucha's low-power acrobatics, take a close combat, and chunk the Halucha's health with Jewel Chomp. And then... I see something. This is... Guaranteed CC. Which is absolutely insane. Because Choice Guard Phantom Force is about to rip through the rest of Vito's team. Choice Scarf is here to outspeed Feramosa, but it also lets me outspeed this Mega Alakazam. And you know what's about to happen? I have made it to the Elite Four! After clearing out Ruts 123 and 115, I pick up one more Pokemon. Carissa the Latias, a roaming legendary who's been on the Devon radar since I beat Archie, and who will be joining my Elite Four team. With that, let's take a look at the team. I've taken full advantage of the resources I've saved throughout my run. I leveled every one of them past the final level cap of 99 using 6 rare candies I saved, and took full advantage of the services offered at every Pokemon Center by relearning moves, maxing out IVs, and changing every member of my team's nature to the one I wanted, except for two where a nature change wasn't needed. This team is going in at its absolute best, so let's meet the members. TS Guy the Dragavolt, the speedy artillery. Clear Body is by far the better ability for this league, making him not care about the multiple intimidates throughout it. Even with a neutral speed nature and lonely, which he got naturally, TS Guy is fast enough to outspeed literally everything he needs to. The one Pokémon a plus speed nature would have made a difference against, Mega Gengar, is something I have a different plan for. He also hits a lot of Pokémon in this league for super effective damage, and in particular, Annihilate Strike. Chomp Chomp the Urshifu, the versatile damage dealer. Chomp Chomp is going to absolutely demolish Sydney and Glacia while putting in work against literally everyone else. Even with an adamant nature, he's fast enough to outspeed almost everything he needs to. Water plus fighting is great offensive and defensive typing against this Pokemon League, and makes him my only answer to Wallace's anchor. The Lockyer Boys, the Primarina. The steadfast support. Primarina plans to get exactly one kill throughout the entire Pokemon League, but his access to Encore, Parish Song, and a relatively slow flip turn makes him my best support Pokemon. A Dragon Immunity is also something I desperately need if I want to beat this League. I couldn't give him a bulk increasing nature, as I needed Jolly for a reason you'll soon see, but he still takes special hits well enough. Brick Brock 24, the Hisuian Gudra, the Unyielding Pivot. Brick Brock is tasked with 1v1ing specific threats during the single battles, but he really shines as an absolute special tank during the double battles, especially thanks to the sassy nature I chose for him. Being immune to poison and resisting rock makes him invaluable against both Sydney and Phoebe, and he'll continue to pull his weight throughout this Elite Four. Carissa the Latias, the reliable team player. Carissa is vital for Phoebe. I have no chance against her without her access to one specific move. Her access to protect and recover and an inability to be one-shot by anything on Phoebe's team thanks to her calm nature allows her to stay on the field for as long as I want her to. She's also going to contribute on Wallace and, if everything goes according to plan, Drake. And finally, Saiyan Scholar, the Sceptile, the God Slayer. 
just wait and see. That's my team. Either they take me to the Hall of Fame, or we won't be able to make it through the league without forcing one of them to fall trying. This ends now. Chapter 8. Wait, am I actually good at this? This Elite Four is terrifying, forcing me to fight exactly two of them in double battles, making for by far the hardest challenge of the run. As I previously mentioned, I am not good at planning double battles. However, if I want to win this challenge I've set for myself, I'll have to learn. This is it. No team changes, no level caps. I'm giving the battles the full screen now. This is the Elite Four. For Sydney, I decide to challenge him to a double battle, leading Dragapult and pre-damaged Sceptile against Cindy's Incineroar and Galarian Articuno. I switch into Pre-Marina and Phantom Force the Articuno as Sceptile baits Fake Out from Incineroar and an attack from Articuno. Next turn, Phantom Force connects, taking Articuno out as my max speed Timid Pre-Marina barely outspeeds Incineroar and encores him into Fake Out. Incineroar is now useless for the next two turns and I've got free reign to target the left side as Pre-Marina baits Overquill. Overquill is guaranteed to attack Pre-Marina, meaning Dragapult is safe to throw out a Draco Meteor as I switch to Hoodra on Gunkshot. From there, Overquill is guaranteed to attack Dragapult, so I double switch to Urshifu and Pre-Marina as Urshifu takes a very weak crunch and Incineroar's Encore ends. Urshifu kills Overquill and I Encore Incineroar into Fake Out again. However, at this point Incineroar is out of Fake Outs, meaning I can no longer Encore. Darkrai is sent out and sees a guaranteed sludge bomb kill on Primarina. I once again switch to Hoodra as Urshifu close combats Darkrai for the KO, and White Herb restores the defense drops. Thanks to White Herb, Sydney's incoming Urshifu can only see a kill on Hoodra, giving me a safe switch into Primarina. Primarina gets healed out of danger with a Wiki Berry, close combat brings Sydney's Urshifu down to Sash, and I Aqua Jet the Urshifu for the KO next turn, as Primarina gets his only direct kill of the league with Hydro Pump on Incineroar. Wait, missed. <laughs> the funny thing is that this doesn't actually matter at all. My play was still the same. Whether Incineroar was on the field or not, the important thing is that Mega Gyarados could never target my Urshifu, letting me chunk his health with close combat and switch into Dragapult on the resisted Power Whip and Flare Blitz. From there, even if close combat hadn't landed a critical hit, Draco Meteor and Surging Strikes would have ended the fight on the next turn. That's the easier of the two double battles. On to... Phoebe. This was, by far, the hardest fight of the run. My plan for Wallace forced me to bring Sceptile through this Elite Four, and that meant I was effectively down a slot here. I had no choice but to challenge her to a double battle, and her team was filled with units that I just couldn't find a way to take down without a dark type, particularly Lunala and Giratina. With that said, I found a line, and it revolves around Latios' access to Tailwind. Here. We. Go. Leader Jafu and Latios, Dragon Pulse the Bird and One-Shot Chandelure with Surging Strikes. Giratina in. Switch to Citrus Berry Hoodra on the double target and Dragon Pulse the Bird. Then switch to Idolist Sceptile to take the failed Poltergeist in close combat as Latios sets up Tailwind two turns after Phoebe does. Then switch to Pre-Marina and kill the Bird, baiting Lunala as Phoebe's Tailwind expires. Lunala and Giratina are now both out, which is exactly what I want. Protect against Phoebe's moves as Latios really needs to stay at full health to keep Phoebe targeting the other side and perish song with Primarina. With exactly one turn of Tailwind left, Primarina outspeeds Lunala, encores her into Meteor Beam as Latios switches out for Hoodra on the potential Dragon Balls. Hoodra switches out for Urshifu, who easily tanks plus two Meteor Beam or Poltergeist and will never have to tank both, and Primarina uses a slow flip turn to get Latios back in. On the last turn of Parish Song, bring Primarina back in on Dragon Pulse and Tailwind as Lunala charges up a Meteor Beam that she'll never get to fire. Both Lunala and Giratina perish, and Gengar and Blastoise are brought in. Switch Primarina out for Dragapult in the Sludge Wave and Psychic the Gengar. Then, Dragon Pulse and Dragon Darts win the fight, with both Latios and Dragapult outspeeding Gengar thanks to Latios' Tailwind. In retrospect, I should have given Dragapult a Cassid Berry to make sure I couldn't lose to fake out Latios and to follow me two turns in a row, but everything worked out. Phoebe... down. Oh my god, that was brutal! <laughs> Thankfully, from here we're back to single battles for the rest of the run, starting with Glacia. This is where Chom Chom is going to make his mark. He starts by one-shotting Glacius lead Mamoswine with Surging Strikes before rocks can be set up. This baits in Enamorous, who I counter with Hoodra. Calyrex is baited out, and I switch back to Chom Chom on random move, both of which we take. And then... this happens. Close combat with Eject Pack Urshifu.
and switching to Primarina. That is actually insane! Because I still have Encore and faster than this, and this means I won't take any damage on Primarina. Flip turn just for some extra chip. And go straight to Dragapult. And now, you'll notice I have Flamethrower on this set, even though this is Choice Band Dragapult spoilers. This is so I bait an Arctivish instead of a Bomb of Snow after I kill this Calyrex. I want a Bomb of Snow to come out last. Free Marina is going to take exactly one hit. And, well... This is eject button Free Marina. It was here for Calyrex, but... It has a second use. In the rare case that Calyrex goes for Swords Dance on Urshifu. Chom Chom kills Arctivish, Dragapult comes in and Kiram and kills with Choice Band Dragon Darts, and Chom Chom takes out the Mega Bomb Snow after switching in on Blizzard. Not at all the safest win, but a win nonetheless. On to Drake. TS Guy, it's your turn. Show us what you're made of. For Drake, I lead with Brick Brock and immediately one-shot Drake's Dragapult with Dragon Pulse, bringing in Crawdon for guaranteed close combat. I catch this with Rocky Helmet Urshifu to break Crawdon's Focus Sash, but since Crawdon landed a high roll critical hit, this baits in Zygarde instead of the Reshiram I had planned. Should have used Jabokaberry. Had Reshiram gone in, I would have pivoted through Habanberry, Latios, and Pre Marina to get Dragapult in safely and kill with Choice Band Dragon Darts, bringing out Zygarde. Instead, I have to deal with Zygarde early and I make some bad plays. I let Pre Marina get glared twice while setting Parish Song up, and Septal isn't glared by the time one turn of Parish Song is left. This is bad, because if I switch to Sceptile now, as Zygarde dies to Parish Song, Salamence will come in, locking me out of the win. The only Pokémon I have that baits in Suicune, who needs to come in next, is Dragapult, who really doesn't want to switch into this plus one Zygarde. In other words, I need to survive this plus 1,000 arrows and break through Paralysis. And I do. I flip turn out to Dragapult, who baits in Suicune, the last Pokémon left that he can't one-shot. But, we're not out. I switch to Primarina, barely survive Suicune's attacks, and break through Paralysis to Encore it into Scald, though I'd have massively preferred Calm Mind. Because Suicune is locked into Scald, there's no way around what I have to do next. I have to win a 50-50. I need to dodge two Scald Birds. If I don't get Skull Burned here, Choice Band Dragon Darts destroys the rest of Drake's team. <sighs> and that's Drake! Oh man, things did not go right at all on Zygarde, but I played to my outs, and I'm past Drake. TS Guy one-shots the rush around with Dragon Darts before doing the same to Mega Salamence, thanks to his lonely nature and clear body ability. I've made it past Drake, and all that's left is Wallace. If you made it this far, thank you so much for watching. I'd also like to thank Kroven and Ned for their Elite Four strategies that seriously helped me make my way through the gauntlet. Everyone who's completed a hardcore Nuzlocke in this game did it under a much harder rule set than mine. Being able to pick my encounters made the game definitely easier to get through, not to mention the fact that I retried every fight until I got through Deathless. Of course, thanks to every single YouTuber I featured in this video. And finally, thanks to Dexa for making this amazing game. I know I didn't play perfectly. 
I've had a lot of time to think about the mistakes I made during each boss fight since I did them, and those mistakes were brought sharply into my focus while I was editing this. In particular, I made a lot of mistakes planning for the Elite Four you just saw. Encounter areas were left open, mistakes with one Pokemon's nature in particular were made, and the fight you just saw, Drake, was filled with more misplays than I even admitted to in my post-commentary just now. Hopefully, I can learn from these mistakes, because I do plan to attempt a hardcore Nuzlocke of this game. But this playthrough wasn't about playing perfectly. It was about having fun and proving that this game could be done deathless. And I think I did both. I don't think a post-commentary could do this Wallace fight justice, especially since my live commentary explained all the strategies you really need to know about it. Are you guys ready for the payoff to my Sceptile bring? I hope you enjoy it. Bye, guys. All right, Wallace. All right, Dexa. I've made my way through the entire game without losing a single Pokemon. I have had to face double battle gym leaders that push me to my limit. I have had to face permanent Tailwind with Shell as a partner, permanent Magma Storm fighting a Destiny Bond Mega Houndoom, a back to back gym leader fight with eight Pokemon, permanent Aurora Veil with a Misty Terrain team, and the Elite Four with its abundance of double battles and box legendaries. But you know what? I got through it. I got through the gyms, I got through Team Aqua and Team Magma, and I got through the Elite Four. And now, I'm about to 6 0 Wallace. Primal Kyogre Leap. Honestly, if this was in the back, it would have been a lot scarier. But since it's in the front, I can lead with my Primal Kyogre counter. And that... would be Hoodra. Brick Brock was taught Thunder via Move Tutor just before entering the Elite Four. Specifically for this fight, because apart from that, his only jobs are to act as a pivot and kill a dragon. But with Thunder, and yeah, he also killed an Amorous. Thunder is what I needed in order to chunk this Kyogre. Brick Rock could actually win this 1v1, but I don't want to. Instead, I'm going to be switching to Latios to kill this. Carissa, you've been doing your job really well throughout this loop. Good job. Now kill a Kyogre! And now with Kyogre down, Wallace is going to send out the demon. <sighs> this Barrascuta is a Pokemon that I've seen most runners sacrifice something to. But since I'm doing this deathless, that's not an option. I have a different plan. Sceptile has been absolutely incredible throughout this one. He hasn't done much in the Elite Four. Before that, he's been pulling his weight ever since I got him from the Lava Ridge Town Hoenn Starter Egg. His amazing speed and ability to hit incredibly hard with Grass-type moves, especially in Overgrow, has been worth not getting a different Hoenn Starter. And he's already killed both Groudon and Kyogre. Unfortunately, he isn't fast enough to outspeed a Swift Swan Bear's Keeper. I could have given him a Choice Scarf, but not only <sighs> would that have locked me out of a Choice Band for the rest of the Elite Four, which was vital for, in particular, Drake, but Choice Scarf isn't even fast enough to outspeed this. But instead, after clicking Endure to get to 1 HP, I click Energy Ball and watch as Custap Berry activates! 
Barra skewed it down! This is gonna bait in the Kutra, since everything is slower and sees kill. I'm gonna answer this with Urshifu. I didn't want to take any damage on Urshifu before fighting Swamper, but I had no choice. Because Urshifu is the only answer I have to this. This fits in guaranteed Palkia. Which is actually a benefit of running Adamant Nature. If it was Jolly, this would have been Manaphy, probably. Now this is random move. Dexa actually had a lot of fun making this champion team. Between the physical Curse Rest Hudra, and this Scope Lens Focus Energy Palkia. There are some pretty fun sets. I would prefer this to be an attack. Fortunately, it is Focus Energy. Dragon Gem Dragon Darts gets the KO. This was always the Pokemon I had the best answer to. Completely unnecessary crit. There's only two Pokemon to go in this entire game. The first of which is Manaphy. Now this is Ice Beam or Tail Glow. I think this is like a, a, a 4 out of 5 to Tail Glow, but I would actually prefer Ice Beam here. <sighs> now just don't freeze and we're good. Now, you might be asking, wait a minute, how are you going to kill this? You gotta do this deathless, and the only way you can bring in the one Pokemon that can kill this is to sacrifice something. But here's the thing, I might be weak to grass, but I've got a Rindo Berry. I did not die in one hit, and that's why I wanted Ice Beam. Because I would have had to rip. Because if it was Tail Glow, I would have had to I would have had to risk a critical hit. And Sceptile isn't done yet. At one HP, he's gonna take out this mythical Pokemon set up to plus three. One to go. There is one Pokemon to go. But it's the scariest one. This Swampert is going for random move. Three of which I'm fine with if I switch to Chom Chom. But if it's Earthquake, I die to the next one. So I need to pivot through Latios. Now, unfortunately, this does die to Ice Punch. So. If Swampert goes for Ice Punch. I need to reveal that I'm holding a Yachi Berry. Now, there are a couple ways this could go wrong. Liquidation Defense Drop, Ice Punch Freeze, or Earthquake Crit. Just don't freeze. This may still be dead to crit. Hold this. Just, just hold this, Chomp Chomp. <sighs> this has been some of the most fun I've ever had playing a video game. Dexa has designed what may be the best Generation 3 ROM hack of all time. 
with a focus on resource management, above all else. You only get one instance of a lot of different items. If you want to win, you gotta use them wisely. I saved basically all of those for the Elite Four, because I was able to get through without burning any of them. I do think that Permanent Magma Storm is a bit overkill, but eh. Regular Nuzlockers will sacrifice something there. It has been an absolutely wild ride. I'm glad I was able to make my way through this game. To let you guys know that yes, it is a well-designed game. And I've just got one thing left to say. 31 plus attack, Urshifu Rapid Strike, Aqua Jet. Versus 31 HP, 31 defense, Mega Swamper in Heavy Rain, 84 to 99 damage. Guaranteed Oko. <sighs> For everyone watching this, I just got one thing to say. We be running by Deathless! <sighs> I may be the first person to ever do this. Depends on if Hyperbolted made through the Elite Four. But honestly, I'm just happy I could do it. In times they dance like a spring breeze, describe Sceptile perfectly. In times they strip like, you know what, I'll just, I'll just end the footage here.